Ve 14 postavila funkční letadlo, ve 20 absolvovala slavnou MIT. V jejich 23 ve své práci citoval Stephen Hawking a svět o ní mluví jako o novém Einsteinovi. Výzvu seznamu přijala nejnadějnější teoretická fyzička světa Sabrina González Pastersky. Hello, welcome. Hi. In 1922 Albert Einstein gave to a bellboy a handwritten recipe for happiness uh, instead of a tip. And this paper was sold two years ago for more than one billion, oh, uh, pardon, oh, one million oh, bucks. <laughs> I would like to give something to my hairs also. So what would be your recipe oh, no, for happiness? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think the thing is, is you have to find your own, um, you know, like you try to follow some recipe for like, this is going to be how I spend this many years of my life. And then the next, however, and I'm going to have X and Y by that time. Um, whatever feels right at the time or whatever seems like that's where you want to see yourself like you got to do some things to get to there but otherwise like I think the point is to make your own and what makes you happy so the happiest I am is when like you've been like you just see something differently and the fun thing about theoretical physics it's not all just happy all the time like you, you have to do a lot of groundwork and like um, research and, and studying stuff that you don't know how you're going to use it yet but um, there's like two modes where, first of all, like you've been stuck in something and then suddenly you see the light for whatever small thing. It's not like it's a big breakthrough, but it just, it's a thrill and then you just dive into it and you just completely forget what time it is and you don't, you like lose track. And then also sometimes you feel like you've found something that's like almost like you're doing some sort of dig and then you find the, like some structure that is nicer than you maybe were looking for. And so both of those just give you this kind of like satisfaction and this like, like drive to want to like go deeper and deeper. And that's where like the like really happiest moments are. <laughs> to complete the story with Albert Einstein, uh, one of the recipes, because actually there, oh, there were two, two of them, oh, man. Uh, said, when there is will, okay. there is also a path. Okay. And uh, in my view, it kind of describes also your journey, uh, because you were first denied from MIT, yeah. and uh, only thanks to a widow, you were building your own plane, uh, helped you to to go to MIT why you decided to make your own plane I think like every time that I've done something um, it's been somebody who suggested like you can do it so I, it was it wasn't so much like I want to do like this one thing and then I go through those steps it is for like for theoretical physics for instance I need to get an undergraduate degree get a PhD I, like there are steps I have to take um, but sometimes you just don't know that you can do something and this is in that line of things. So um, when I was younger and I was like hanging around Oshkosh and there were some people from the FAA and they say like, oh look, you could build a kit too. And a lot of other like older people build kit planes. It's a, it's a hobbyist thing. Um, you just wouldn't even think of doing that. And then like, and you wouldn't think, oh, maybe MIT is right for me and not somewhere local, like my family's from Chicago. And so it's just kind of a, like a, a gelling of things that you're interested in and you see down the line and then listening when people suggest something that you can do right now towards that. Uh were you afraid to, to fly your um, own plane? It was a while after. So the fun thing was I had been working on this kit from like 12 to 14, and then I could fly alone in Canada at that age. But it had almost been like so much of my life like ago that I had started taking the flying lessons in the States that it was just kind of like, like okay, now I'm 16, now I can do this. It, it, so, <laughs> so it was weird because it, it was, it was very satisfying. License. It was very satisfying, for instance, like being able to kind of complete, like you did this thing and now you actually get a fly in it. Um, but it, what, like somehow it wasn't just like, it was kind of like, okay, now I'm old enough to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to fly the, by yeah, your own. Yeah, and by myself in the States, yeah. Uh, tell me, what was actually the reason the MIT denied you? Oh, I probably my essays. I don't, we'll, we'll see how I like, like explain what I do now. Um, the the thing is, is that I don't. I think it's hard to say. Like, you can't say like, oh, these students deserve to be at this university, or that they need that university to succeed in what they do. I wanted to be at like at MIT. Um, it had a great air roster department, has great physics. So I, like, I was fortunate for what major I ended up in. But um, I think I. I, I just probably didn't sell myself right or whatever I did. I had like the good numbers on, on a piece of paper. Um, but like in the end, I think it's not like, oh, I didn't get in. And I, I mean, I had that attitude where I'm going to do better now. But it's just a lot of people just don't get what they want and you have to find a way around it. So. Uh, I was just thinking if uh, uh, it could have something to common with underestimation of girls? Oh, I don't think, so. I mean, I think MIT has a lot of girls coming in. I feel like if I try to say that, like, like there are a lot of people who just, just you know, end up on the wait list. Um, I, 
I, I wouldn't know. I, I never tried to look at my file. I didn't want to know once I didn't. I just decided, like, okay, I'm on the wait list. Everybody else has gotten in, so I know I'm at, like, the bottom of my class coming in. Let's try to, like, do better and, and like, prove yourself. And it gave me a chip on my shoulder as far as getting good grades. But in the end, good grades don't really matter. But, like, it has some, you have some reason to prove yourself. And I think that's good. It's some sort of drive. For me, it gave me more drive. Um, but... Like, I think MIT recruits heavily for, like, at least at the undergraduate level, there really isn't so much of an issue of incoming class being, um, like, not being a parity symmetric with uh, male and female. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to put it to that. <laughs> I was just asking because yeah. uh, uh, you are supporting the so-called uh, women empowerment movement in science. Is that still white boys' playground? Um, I would say that anybody, I mean, everybody should be supporting that. I don't know if I've done anything in particular like towards that except for however people decide like oh here's a role model here's whatever um that's that's not like not my choosing um but i think that maybe the unfortunate thing is sometimes like the role models for like discoveries that you're really like curious about and you've heard about are just like a couple generations back or like even a couple decades and so you don't necessarily see the progress that's like that the people who are like a lot of females who are in the field will be doing by the time that you're also like in that field um, so it, it's kind of, it's hard to try to say, like, yes, all of our idols happen to be maybe, like, more likely to be men by, like, a, like a lot. Um, but was that because, like, there was just this time frame where a lot of people were doing very interesting things that we're, like, learning about now or, like, still in, in school? And, like, there just, there was that issue back then, you know? So rather than, like, oh, I can't do that. Like, I definitely do not have that attitude. Do you feel like a role model? Uh, I feel like any role model wouldn't be able to say they are. I, I feel like I shouldn't be. I mean, I think that if anybody says they are, that's great. I mean, I think you should try to find role models, not in people, like, like in anybody around you, right? Like, if you say, like, you're studying something and one person does better than you on a test, it's like, I want to be like that. Like, great, everybody can be a role model to <laughs> someone, so. You yeah. can be one because the media have chosen a yeah, yeah. title for you, I a am, new Einstein. In front of the cameras. No, no, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> one you, thing when you have intro in a different language. And you don't like it. I don't. No, well, I mean, because it's, it's, it's ridiculous, though. I mean, it's 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 funny. Like, the thing is, is that I, I, have, I haven't done anything to, just, like, show that I am. And then even if somebody, who, like, somehow thought that they were, had, like, some sort of, like, discovery that would make them on the same level of, like, different prizes, it's it's really not good to try to tell, say that this person is the next so-and-so. And you see that even, like, in the music industry. I think that we love to, like, latch on to, like, individual idols. And I, I definitely have idols within my field, and they're older and, like, and um, they were doing great things in the 80s, say. But it's just, like, you want to be your own person at some point, too. But then also, like, for me, I mean, I was a grad student. It wasn't like that I want to, I'm saying, oh, I'm Sabrina and not somebody else. It's that, like, I haven't deserved the attention for, for my, any work in my field yet. I feel like I'm a good grad student or was a good grad student. Now I've graduated. Um, but I still have to prove myself. So. so what would be a success or discovery good enough for you to, oh, to admit know. that you are Oh, no, I would never. Oh, first of all, I would never say that. Um, I think that the thing, like our field has a lot of, like, like, like it's not just how much you like it. There is a little bit of, like, do you get citations and things like that. So I, there will, there are, like, there will be a sense in which I will know whether or not I've made it enough to get a faculty position or, like, any sort of, like, prizes that happen. Like, I, I mean, I, like, and I haven't yet, so I'm, I'm just starting out. Um, but I think that if I said I want to do X, if I say it, I wanted a prize, or if I said I wanted to have this discovery, I will just set myself up for, for disappointment. Because the fun thing about our field is that you, you, like, you study these things and you were interested in, say, understanding something about quantum gravity, and you try to like, dive into it. And when you first start out, you don't really know what it is that you're diving into. Like, if you say, I'm going to solve some information paradox, you say, you name a problem. If that problem's already been named, there have been so many people trying to solve that exact problem. And how are you, unless that was something that you obsessed over, the likelihood of you being that person who's going to find whatever ingredient's missing in, in your misunderstanding is just, it's, the odds aren't in your favor. Versus the point of our field, hopefully, is that like there are so many things to, out there to find that you learn, you do what you can, and at some point like you just get sucked into a problem. And then like if you're passionate about it, you'll do good work in it. So tell me, what, yeah. what, uh, what is it you are sucked in? But please, oh, remember, man. you are talking no, to I... a man <laughs> who just knows a string theory is something yeah. which Sheldon Cooper is working on oh, in no, Big Bang Theory. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, see, and the funny thing is, is like when, if I said I did string theory, I, what I do isn't very stringy. So like, from my technical point of view, we're doing something that like string theorists have been led to and like Maldasena or so 20 years ago, um, 
Okay, so it's inspired by string theory, but I would say like what I work on is kind of just trying to do what I can do. Um, and so like I have a wonderful advisor who like poses some questions that are interesting, not just, I mean, I'm interested in like, I can solve something. I'm a physicist, that's great. I'm like a, just playing with equations. Um, so the, the, the overarching theme is trying to say, like, what can we say about gravitational scattering? Say we believe in string theory, how do we get to um, the structure of like the fields that we see, the three plus one space-time dimension, say. Those are all questions where you go back and you read your like quantum field theory textbooks again or some like um, curved space analogs of those and try to just like understand the basics and then you do like your actual research work on some very specific problem. So when I get sucked into something, I get sucked into like very detailed little problems. Like they're not monumental in any sense. But sometimes they have some cool thing where like, hey, if we observe this, then we'll say that this analysis is relevant. Um, so if I, even if I could convey exactly to you what I do, I feel like I would make it like l more like lackluster than um, like the kind of the sheer joy of just like figuring something out that you're stuck on. And it, like you hope that one day it's something where it's not just you, you were stuck on it, but other people have been stuck on it for a while. And, and I think that the, like the scope just grows as you have like more experience. But like what I'm doing is just like just playing with equations and seeing how to interpret them. And like at a very, very small level um, right now. <laughs> <laughs> and is the image uh, we yeah. see in the Big Bang Theory that you theoretical th physicists are standing in front of an uh, empty flip chart and <laughs> flip thinking chart? hard. What? No, blackboards <laughs> for sure. But <laughs> so what's your normal day? Oh, my normal day. Um, so the, the productive days are ones where um, you get to talk to people working on slightly different things or even working on what you're doing. Um, and there, there often is a chalkboard involved. Um, uh, like a lot of times we, it's like pen and paper or Mathematica aided pen and paper computations. Um, sometimes you'll like, so you start, well, let's do like end of the day or beginning of the morning, depending on who you are. Like you'll get a, I'm not on the email thread, but I would check the archive. It would make it my homepage. So you see what people are working on. Maybe there's like 20, 25 papers in your subfield that are posted. So you see what's up. Um, and that starts your day in the sense that you're like, oh, so-and-so just finished that, good. And like, oh, this is some interesting result. Maybe you'll read that. Um, but when you're then going to a problem, like you say, I've been working on a couple things, but what, what can I tackle right now? And you try to like, like see there's some computations that will be easy enough to do and you go through and do them and then hopefully in the meantime you, you find something interesting or, um, or, or like you realize you get stuck on something. So what I would say like the days that are like productive are ones where you're trying to, you do something that you think is straightforward and then you get surprised and those are fun. Or you have, we're stuck on something, and then like in like when you're going to bed, you realize you think about it differently, and then you understand it, and then you're just all the whole day computing something and writing a little note up. But like the best days come from like talking to other people because they just have a slightly different like they ask you questions more than you'd ask yourself, and and then you get to like show what you're computing and, and stuff. So that that would be like a fun good day in the office is like having a couple of different projects you're still working on and talking to the, your collaborators on them, and getting tested because you're like having to explain something. Okay, yeah. uh, maybe back to the start yeah. of the day. A okay. uh, few weeks ago, you yeah. must be thrilled because in the emails maybe okay. or some... What happened? <laughs> uh, the black hole yes, image that came is out. Cool. So that is cool, like really cool, but more cool for some people who are my collaborators. So the fun thing, like I don't get to, I, I think it's just cool, um, but like some people who I work with actually get to they try to make predictions for what they're going to see next when they see not just the light coming at you, but um, the polarization of the light. So the fun thing is that the, the you're looking at like say light coming from a region around this like spinning black hole and the geometry there has this extra symmetry where you might be able to use tools from holography which it's like describing a gravitational theory with one lower dimension to make um, some predictions for what they will actually see when they when they look um, uh, at, at the event horizon um, it, it a little bit more data that they're going to collect um, so so it's exciting just for the fact that like you can see like this hole <laughs> um, but then also uh, like that there are like starting points for like my advisors worked on something called Kerr CFT and he's really into that. Um, and so like there's fun things where there's interplay between theorists and experimentalists. Um, so it, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the chance to study the black holes uh, yeah. and um, maybe the chance to prove the super string theory and so on is dream of your <laughs> theoretical physics. Yeah. But tell me, what was the dream of small Sabrina? Oh what was man, the aim to I achieve? think when I was very, very little, there was like a moment where I wanted to be like a pop star or something like that. But I think I, I still, I, 
I think that, like, I, I, when I want to do aerospace, it definitely wasn't, like, theoretical physics. Um, I think that I've had, like, sometimes when you're in aerospace, there's a lot of almost, like, bigger dreamers than you might see in theoretical physics. Because often, so what happens when you go to theoretical physics, all these things that, like, sci-fi people love, like, time travel and whatever. Star like, Trek they're, and Star they're Wars. built into, like, the, like, assumptions for a good field theory not having, like, the ability to do those things. So you realize, like, I'm not going to discover any of that studying this. Like, I'm going to, like, learn how, assuming not that, gives me a good theory and, and, and what I can say about, like, some sort of space of coupling constants. Um, so, so that goes out the window. But I think that part of people, like, the, the, the people I grew up around with in aviation were very, like, like wanting to send people to Mars and all this, like, like dream big um, stuff that kind of they admired physicists. I liked, I didn't like working in something where I didn't have a good understanding of what it was I was doing. And I liked that in physics, I might not know a lot and I might feel overwhelmed sometimes. But then whenever I am doing, I know what I'm doing, like the individual manipulations. And, and so you have this kind of autonomy. You have this um, sense of, like, purpose at times where you can really like kind of control your, or you, you, like you feel like you're in control of, of maybe your destiny. You're not really, but like you, you kind of think that like I can, I can do something rather than I'll be a part of something. And you are just really in the end a part of something, but like there's this, this individual uh, part of it um, that kind of made me like it. And I also did well in school. So I mean, it just like, all led to like physics. <laughs> I mean, within physics, I picked like theoretical physics, the best stuff for me. I, Okay, yeah. what was the most Im inspirational moment you mm. uh, knew? Oh, I'll be physicist. Oh, I don't know. I think it's like, oh, I'm a physicist. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, oh, I am. No, right. no, no, no. It's more like, because I think it, I was really on the fence about wanting to do aerospace engineering um, as opposed to physics. And then somehow it was like, I had the first semester classes or first year classes at MIT went well. And then I was like, I'm going to major in physics. Um, and then you take more courses. And I think that... Like, I didn't know I would be, like, a high-energy theoretical physics um, student or, like, physicist until, like, after I had applied to grad school. Because um, then you, you get to meet the professors when you take classes with them and then, like, fall in love with whatever they're doing or, like, really like that class more. So the, what I liked about my GR class with my, like, who's now my advisor, Andy, um, is just how much more of it you felt like you were, like, understanding on the way there instead of just assumptions that were being thrown on. So... Um, it's, there's some very elegant stuff, um, and and it's cool to try to hope that one day you're going to also add to that story. But even just to learn, like theoretical physics is is wonderful for someone who even just likes reading textbooks. But it, that's not a good theoretical physicist. <laughs> Nowadays, you are an inspiration Aww. for many people. Uh, so tell me, what are you going to tell people at the innovation week? Because uh, that's why you I'll are in the Czech Republic. I think I'll see what they say. I mean, the question I, it all depends <laughs> on what they're asking, right? Because it's a panel, and so you, like. You don't have blanket advice for anything, or even like if they want advice. Um, I, I I think it really just depends on what they ask. Okay. <laughs> uh, when did you realize that you are smarter than many people? No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh 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 uh. I was very adamant about it being hard work when because I, I do well in. You can do well in grades. So if you have a test or something and you can try to do well on it, like I don't know how much that proves, but it definitely. So, so, so say there are things where like you think like, oh, maybe they don't think I'm smart. I can show that I am not not smart by doing well in a test. And so for a while there, that motivated me, and it shouldn't have as much. Um, so I never felt like, I never felt bad about myself. I felt like I was good. I don't know if it was intelligence or if it was just the hard work I studied a lot. Um, but I think the question is more just like how much you enjoy solving problems, too. Um, I feel like there are a lot of people who are very smart that just would they would be a nightmare to be working on some of the stuff that we do because it's like you spend a lot of time and you don't know what you're going to get out considering what you have to put in, um, and so like it's hard to say like if say I say I fail at something I'm not going to try to tell myself I'm I'm not as smart as X who was able to do these things. It's a combination of did you find that niche that you're like really into because you don't want to make somebody do something that they're they don't enjoy, and then say that they're not smart because they didn't do this other thing. <laughs> that was harder, <laughs> maybe. You're trying to, to, to obey that, uh, that you are a little extraordinary, but there, uh, there is one. I would hope to be. Conditionally, right? So say I'm, I'm, I'm doing this bet where I'm spending how many, like a decade of my life studying something, and I think that I have the nerve to think that I have a chance of doing something good, then I'd better, in the back of my mind, hopefully think that maybe I, like, I don't know what I'm, either I'm going to do something really different because I'm, like, doing something other people aren't doing or that I'm special. I don't 
think it's good to try to actually convey that you are special. I think everybody should believe that they're more special than they are, <laughs> <laughs> like inside and like keep that quiet just because it helps motivate you. But it's definitely not something where like it means anything because it, it, in the end, it's just self-confidence. And I'd rather be confident that what I'm doing will pay off. And so like I know I'm going to put the work in then just be confident because I think I'm awesome or something like that. I, I don't know. There is really one special thing about you, uh -oh. uh, and it's that uh, you do not use social networks. You have yeah. no Facebook, no Insta, no Twitter, no yeah. whatever. Why is that? Um, well, probably started when I didn't really have that many friends in high school. But, <laughs> but aside from that, I think that I would be too into... I, I feel like the Internet's kind of like a pacifier sometimes. Um, in, it, it's, no, it can be used great, like for conveying information. Like, and, and there's, I'm, I love the fact that I can access textbooks online, like legally. Um, with, and, no, no, right, right, there's like so much, so much I use from it. But it's just, you know, I, I have people around me I can talk to. If they don't want to tell me what they're up to, I don't need to like, like Facebook stalk them or something like that. Um, I, I think it just started as something I wasn't doing, and then I just never like went into it after everyone's like, oh, she don't do it. Like, okay, yeah. I, I, I think that it isn't good to try to not do things for the sake of like being different because for a while I had like a flip phone and I was kind of proud of it and then I realized like I can't get an Uber like and then now I have a, a normal smartphone. Um, so I'm not opposed to it in principle. I think that it would it would be a distraction for me but it's you know it, especially if some people need like what you do you need to be on social media all the time. What would like how do you convey or, or, or at least some sort of like media outlet. Um, yeah so for me I don't I don't need it and if I did I would be wary of like am I selling my field or myself and when I should just be doing the work, so. Okay, yeah. another special thing is uh, that you had an open post at uh, uh, Blue Origin, uh, oh, the, the company uh, of uh, Jeff Bezos. When, yeah, I mean, would you I make mean, ever uh, use of it? I hope, I mean, when I do, that would say that, <laughs> like, like I didn't get my, my whatever cool idea in physics. Um, I, I would love if one day, like, like theoretical, whatever we're doing for theoretical physics doesn't just restrict the physicist to being, like, like how do I want to say? It? Like I feel like if you look at the trajectories of people who do really good work, they do really good work, and then maybe like you know they they had they had their their most productive moments. Um, I'm not opposed to like being involved, not as like someone who's working on it, because I wanted to do a theoretical physics, but like it's it's cool to have to get to know more people who are, are a part of um, just very interested in technology things and like private aerospace um, I don't see myself like taking up that type of offer because I feel like I like physics because I feel like I'm kind of my own boss um, so it's a kind of an entrepreneurial thing where I wouldn't try to like just jump and work for a company um, but yeah I don't know I, I still it's amazing. To, it's amazing to me when I meet people who are entrepreneurs, who are like some like sometimes you meet them like at conferences like this, and they, the time scale at which they do things and just they can get things done is always like super impressive to me. And it's like, you know, I think I'm doing something for this long term scale and it'll pay off. And hopefully, it, it's meaningful to me and it's meaningful because we're trying to understand these fundamentals. But there's there's some cool stuff that people. Are doing. Okay. Yeah, sorry. And, and would you? Uh, <laughs> just fine. Uh, would you like to go to the space? Oh, uh, no. No, I mean, I, I mean, we're in <laughs> you space are... as far as like we're on a very nice spaceship <laughs> called Earth. We're running this, you know, like as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, translation invariance. I don't care. I mean, I can just like go up and down on an airplane and like nose dive to feel the like zero G. Um, but um, you can have the zero G. At, yeah, right. At NASA we can see center. it exactly. No, or no. I mean, you can even assess it for a little, very little bit. Like you put a pen on. Um, on the dash and then just like like start descending rapidly and you can like lift up a little bit. <laughs> um, but not as long as like, these, these oscillating like jet flights that they do. Um, okay, uh, I would like to go to Albert Einstein for the last time. Oh no, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if there would be chance Yeah. Uh, and you could pose him just one question. If I could pose him one question, I feel like then I would have done something in physics pretty cool that I like wouldn't need to ask that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Like, right, in the sense that, right, the only way I would be able to ask him a question would be, like, something violating our laws of physics, so. <laughs> so it would be predicated on something that I would already, yeah, probably know the answer. Okay, so. <laughs> and uh, what question you think uh, is the most important question people should ask, and what's the answer to that? What am I going to do next? <laughs> And the answer for you? Oh, for me, I mean, for me, I, I'm doing a postdoc. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, but I think, I, 
I think that there isn't one question if, if, if within physics that like you say like everybody needs to be thinking about. And I think it's good because if everybody's thinking about the same thing, then you get stuck collectively. Um, so it's about finding new things to do. Okay, that was Sabrina Pasterski. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you.